trying to I'm not trying to be polite, bro. You just force my hand to be honest, man. I don't want to hear no paragraphs and tears and bloody 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 bro. Your your thing is trash. Your thing is trash. Your thing is like a trash bag. You are dead. Dead. Deceased. D A D. I'm ashamed of of mixing energies with you. Right. Where do we go from here, man? <laughs> Me and a man them call you Georgie. Georgie Pooji, you're fat. <laughs> and now you fat and your bum is flat. Make it make sense. Please make it make sense for me. Pick a struggle. You gotta realize, yeah. A fine boy like me, I get babes. <laughs> I get babes. Like, where do you think that you fall in the ranking of these babes? Like, You're getting relegated. I'll be I'll, I'll be real with you. You're getting relegated. You're going to Division One, and you're falling every season. <laughs> oh my days, man! The deadest thing that I've beat. That's the that's 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 the truth. At the end of the day, you've been bothering me, and now a man's telling you the truth. Can you digest it? Like the rest of that food that you're eating all day, can you digest it? Hmm. And you're dumb. Lack of intelligence. Like I can't. I, I don't. I, when I conversate with you, I feel like my brain is dying. If you ask me, so say, dear, yeah. How old are you? Eighteen. Sixteen. Whatever. Okay. Say. So, Dear 16-year-old Arch. Dear 16-year-old Arch. I forgive you for being a victim. I forgive you for being a victim. I forgive you for falling for a narcissist manipulation. I forgive you for falling for a narcissist manipulator. It was not my fault. It was not my fault. It was not your fault. It was not your fault. You are a beautiful soul. You are a beautiful soul. So, you are not a whore. You are not a whore. You are not a slut. You are not a slut. You will thrive in life. You will thrive in life. And that demon will rot in hell. And that demon will rot in hell. Okay, baby, give me that. Thank you so much, love you. Cool, over glass, you'll need a new windscreen. When I send the whole brick flying in clean, I jumped, you cheated on me anyway, sick dream. I woke up angry and pity, I'm going in deep When you say my name, better hashtag toxic Hold grudges forever, so if you want this Hello, my name is Lani Good and welcome to my YouTube channel I have done a very, very intense and emotional and thought-provoking documentary about love tattoos It's mainly about women that get tattoos of men on their bodies to prove their love this might seem like a very weird topic or a, just a weird subject to go into and people might wonder why why that topic Lani? Not only did I do it because it's personal to me because I have a man's name tattooed on my body but the other reason that I thought I should do it is because I when I started asking questions and researching into this topic I realized that the majority not all but the majority of people that get that partner's name is on their bodies are in abusive relationships. If you are patient and you wait and you listen to these girl stories, you will be mind blown. You will hear several stories of abuse, not only physical, not only mental. Unfortunately, you also hear SA. You will hear stories about women being R A P E, you know, the rest of it. I would really. I would really appreciate it if nobody took these women's stories and laughed at them and bullied them. Some of these things some of these women have done, you might not do, granted. I don't expect anybody to judge anybody. 
Before I introduce you to the ladies, I'm going to talk about myself. Like I said, this topic is very near and dear to my heart because it's personal. When I was about 25 years old, I was madly in love with a man called DJ. And I felt like I had no option but to do a grand gesture of love so that he would treat me better. I thought I was doing it because it was romantic. Most men that would ask a woman to do this are narcissistic. When I was doing my research, something that was very interesting is I came to the realization that there's a pattern. So I have bite-sized and tried to summarize the five stages that women go through when they are in these sort of abusive, controlling relationships. The first stage is you meet a man or a woman, a narcissist. Narcissistics are very, very charming. If you speak bad of a narcissist to their friends or people that know them, usually people would be shocked that you would say that of them because people tend to think that most narcissists, like I said, are charmed and they're liked by the majority of people. All these women in the first stage have a good story, a nice story, a romantic story. These men were consistent. These men chased them. These men loved them. This is Arj, a beautiful, brave young woman who I'm so proud of because she's sitting here bearing it all for you guys. She's literally being vulnerable in front of the world. Her story is truly inspiring. Looking at Arj, you would never know that she has a deep-rooted traumatic past. And I'm so proud of her today for sharing that story with you all. So sit back, relax, and let's all listen to this beautiful young lady share her story. Stage one. Hi, my name's Arjun. I'm 24 and I do fashion. Uh, when it comes to the tattoos, I have four in total. Um, all the same person, three of them being his name or a variation of his name. Um, those three being covered up now. And one of his initial that I'm still waiting to cover up. So the first one was on my rib. Um, the second one was on my bum, my right bum cheek. Third one was under my boob, my left boob. And then the fourth one's on my ankle, the initial. With the tattoo placements, um, I didn't really get a choice where I put them. It was more of a thing of he wanted to make sure in his head that if another man was to look at my body, they would see his name branded on it in places that would be quite revealing or sexual in that way. Hence the one on my arse, hence the one under my boob, the one on my rib. I feel like I owe it to people around me who are my friends to kind of give them the insight of why I disappeared. <laughs> um... How I met him, I was 16, 15, summer of... No, summer of when I turned 16 and I was on holiday. I was back home in Turkey and my cousin, I don't know if anyone remembers it, there was some website called Ask FM um, and you could go on there, you can ask people questions and it'll be like, you can either do it anonymously or you can put your screen name on there. So one day I'm on Ask FM after we've come back from holiday, like on holiday, I was on it all summer in Turkey with my cousin, just like, you know, getting to know people. And then one day when I'm back school, well, I think college, just before college has started that year, this guy messages me like fucking gorgeous man, like absolutely gorgeous, 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 gorgeous boy. And he messaged me like Tiger's lyrics, I can't even remember. So I replied to him. And then we start going like back and forth. And back then Skype was this massive thing as well. Um, Facebook and stuff like that. And he asked me for my Skype. He calls me. We're talking on the phone. We're talking, talking, talking. Everything's really cute. He's got an American accent. And he's like saying all the nicest things to me. At this time, keep in mind, he told me he was 17. I was 16. Um, 
Yeah, we're talking whatever, and then gradually, like, it becomes a thing of we're talking every single second of every single day. And everything's so nice in the beginning. And he's like, oh my God, I love you. Da, da, da. And I'm like, love? <laughs> um, I don't know about that one. And then I told him I loved him back. And then um, a couple months later, like, keep in mind, communicating this whole time. Everything's great. A couple months go by and things start getting a bit weird. Like I'm wanting to meet him. He's not wanting to meet me. Come on, like, we've been talking for a couple months. You said you live in the UK. You said you're an exchange student. You said, like, you know, you're here. Like, why can't I see you? With it? And I tried to break things off, but he was like, absolutely fucking not. Not having it. Not breaking up with you. Whatever. At this point, he'd already asked me to be his girlfriend. Um, and I had not met him. And then, um, yeah, things just started getting really weird. Um... Where, like, he'd call me in the morning and, like, stay on the phone to me until, like, let's just say he's called me at 8 a.m. He'd stay on the phone to me, like, until 3 p.m. Like, and I'm at college the whole day. The whole day. And he's, like, on the phone to me during my lectures, during my lessons, during, like, me either going to piss. He would be like, no, take your phone with you. I need to know where you're going, what you're doing at all times. Yeah, so it went like that for a couple months where he'd be like, I don't trust you. Like, you're in a school full of boys and, you know, somebody's going to want you because you're so pretty and stuff. And I'd be like, oh my God, like, no, babe, I'm all for you. Like, <clears throat> like, I'm your girlfriend. There's no one else out there that I'd even look at if anyone attempted to approach me. That's how it went. And then one of the days he was like, do you want to go out for food? I was like, oh, I thought you were too busy to eat me. And then I was like, yeah. But then he was like, no, sorry. He was like, no, I've got time today. Like, yeah. And then he flakes on me. The next day comes, doesn't talk to me the whole day. The next day comes, same thing. Like, oh, do you want to go for food? I'm so sorry, I didn't get to see you. Da, 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 da. And then he comes to see me. <sighs> he did not look like anything that he did online. Um, keep in mind, like, I had him on Instagram. <laughs> Had him on Facebook, had him on Twitter, and all his pictures were like kind of the same. But it turns out everything was a burner account. So everything was a burner account and he was a cafe. So he lied to me about the way he looked and stuff. And obviously me being 16, I'm not really, I wasn't really thinking about, oh, I'm on Skype, him to turn a video camera on. Like, it wasn't really a thing like that. And obviously it was like, mm, what? <laughs> Who are you and what the hell is going on here? And he was like, I'm so sorry. Like, um, I was too scared to tell you the truth. You can leave now if you want. Like, we don't have to talk to each other ever again. And I was like, no, it's all right. Like, I, I love you for who you are. I don't love you for the way you look. stage is the most important stage and even if you don't have a tattoo on your body I want you to listen to this stage because I feel like if you are in an unhealthy if you are in an unhealthy relationship you might actually you might actually um recognize this stage the second stage that these narcissistic men do or women is the doubt stage now what I mean by the doubt stage is this is the stage where things are going to change. So what they did initially to you was love from you. What they did initially to you was treat you like an absolute princess. And for you to think, I finally, maybe met the one. You know, the one I'm gonna marry, the one I'm gonna walk down the aisle with. Second stage is to change that. Now, things start to be a bit shaky. A way to make things seem a bit shaky and to make you stress out, or the victim stress out, is to start acting inconsistent. So the behavior pattern is completely different in this stage. They might not call you back as quickly as they used to. And remember, at this point, you're sucked in. You're sucked all the way in. These people are professionals. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So they will not do it prematurely. They will not do it to a woman 
who is not interested in them or a woman who's not chalant. They will do it to women who are, have shown that, yes, I like you, I am into you, and I'm open to pursuing this relationship wholeheartedly. Second stage, making you have doubts. So inconsistent behavior, and sometimes another tactic that these people will do, to be more specific, is the game of the hot and the cold. It will give you, a, give you a weekend of love. They'll be romantic. They'll shower you even with gifts. And then they could go cold just like that. They can disappear off the planet for three days. They can slap themselves on a date. They can just play toxic, manipulative games. And at this point, remember, you are sucked in. No, they do not do this prematurely. They do this when you are deeply sucked in. And you sit there and you're talking to your friend on the phone and you're asking yourself questions when you're in bed by yourself. What has changed? Why have they all of a sudden done this? And it's not like the person has said to you, I am not interested. I want this to be over. This person is hot and this person is cold. And even if they do sometimes, say, mm, I'm not sure about this, then the next minute they are. This is all manipulation. So the second stage for me is doubt, and it's about doubt for the receiver. Uh, putting feelings of, am I good enough? Am I worthy of this relationship? Would you treat me better if I was low key? Would you treat me better if I didn't have Instagram? Would you treat me better if I covered up more? Would you treat me better if I was not loud? Would you treat me better if I wore my natural hair? Would you treat me better if I didn't wear eyelashes? Would you treat me better if I didn't wear makeup? Would you treat me better if I was, my body count was less than six? These types of things, just to make you feel insecure and insignificant, these things slowly break in your confidence bit by bit, bit by bit. The hot and cold game can speed up and heighten the feeling of being in love. If someone is hot with you one day and then cold with you the another, another day, they essentially um controlling your mood and your feelings towards just your daily your daily activities you might be down one day because you've argued with your boyfriend you might be happy another day because your boyfriend's being lovely essentially all this up and down up and down and being on a roller coaster can really affect you psychologically and 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 just emotionally very very deeply to the point where it's like it's basically like being addicted to a drug and the reason i use such an extreme example to compare it to is when you're on a drug you have a high when you're not on the drug you you may feel low or have um urges for it withdrawal symptoms you may feel rubbish without it because you're addicted you need it you fiend for it and that is how they get you it is literally the same they use the same tactics as people who are addicted to drugs to lure you in it is manipulation to its core and if you are in this situation right now you better run because i've warned you this hot and cold game is a dangerous dangerous evil 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 game we carried on dating and then a couple of weeks go by and that's when like the verbal abuse starts <sighs> yeah so verbal abusing starts and that goes on for a very long time very long time and then it becomes emotional abuse so he would tell me that nobody wants me that i'm ugly that there's nothing to me that i um there's no one in this world that could ever love me because my dad doesn't even love me my dad left me when i was a kid and that's all my fault um how I'm a whore. keep in mind still a virgin at 16 never once seen a penis in my life calling me a whore um telling me like literally like telling me lies about myself saying that i've slept with x amount of people and that uh, i've done x with this guy here and he believes that i've fucked every single guy in my year group a person that that can break you down you know make you believe their lies about yourself when you know yourself uh, it comes to a point of they become you they control your every thought a couple months go by it starts getting really emotional like emotional abuse um where it's like oh i don't love you i don't love you i don't love you i don't love you you don't please me you don't appease me you're not attractive to me da, 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 da. after be um 
so of course like, at this point I've just turned like 17 I believe um he said to me that he doesn't love me that I don't I'm not attracted to him whatever and I've turned around being this little vulnerable broken down girl babe what is it that I can do to make you want me he was like yeah obviously I want to have sex with you and take your virginity and stuff and I was like I can't do that I can't and he was like well next best thing is I'm going to send you a list of positions and you're going to get naked and you're going to take pictures for me so he did and I did obviously being young not knowing about sex and stuff um, he texted me these positions that he wanted me to like very descriptive exactly how he wanted them taken how he wanted them taken for example it would be like bend over like get on your hands and knees bend over in the mirror obviously naked put your face in it so like everything would be on show and it would be stuff like that and he just wrote me this massive list of pictures to take and obviously I didn't know nothing about sex I had to fucking google everything everything I googled came up on porn so it was like okay I guess you want some personal porn pictures I took every single one I think the first that he asked me to take was I think it was like a group of 10 11 pictures and then that's how they started accumulating um, every day, if it's not every day, it would be every other day, he'd ask me to take, like, he'd send me just, like, it's all coming back to me now, it's so weird. Um, he'd ask me just to take these, like, random position pictures, and I'd do it, and I'd do it, I'd do it without a second thought, like, I'd do it. If, if Even if I was at college, I'd go into the college bathrooms, like the disabled toilets, and I just strip down naked and I take these pictures for him. And I'd send it to him and I'd feel so accomplished. And I'd be like, oh my God, yeah, now my boyfriend actually loves me. My boyfriend's attracted to me now. I'm so sexy. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. I didn't know, I didn't know what sexy was. But I damn well know, like, my 16, 17 year old body did not look sexy in those pictures. He didn't react well. He didn't like them because I'm 16, 17. Keep in mind, at that age, I was super skinny. I had barely any boobs. I had no bum. I was basically borderline anorexic. And he was unhappy with the fact that there was no meat on my bones. And he'd make me take them over and over and over again until it looked like I had a fat ass or I had big tits. And there were like one or two times where he'd be happy about it. And he'd be like, oh my God, I love you so much. But then keep in mind, once he's told me to retake these set of pictures that I've already sent him, he's already got a previous set of 10 of the same pose, the same pictures. And now I've sent him another so that's accumulated to 20. And then if he wasn't happy with that set, that's now 30. Months and months go by and for months, it's verbal abuse, it's emotional abuse. And now the black man starts. He would, um, he had all the login details at this point. He manipulated me to give him all my details for like Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all of that. And whenever he was short of money, because I had a job at this point as well, I was juggling college and work. Um, whenever he was running out of money or whenever we'd argue about something. Keep in mind, I never started the arguments. He would always start the arguments. He would always break up with me. Um, he would blackmail me. He'd be like, if you don't send me 300 pounds right now, I'm going to send these pictures to your mom. I'm going to send these pictures to your dad. I'm going to post them everywhere. Um, and he did that to me for about, I'd say two, a year and a half, and I did. I sent him money every single time, and when I didn't have money, he would log into my Facebook and he would buy it. Just random people he'd send it to, like people who don't even know me, like people who I hadn't spoken to in years. Like he would just send it to them, and these random people would message me and be like, "Yo, what the f like, what's going on?" Like, 
And I just I have to delete and block these people. Like these are people that I went to school with. Like it ruined it ruined me. Um, there was a point where so after a while when I couldn't afford to keep paying him, he came up with the idea of why don't you cut my name into your body and make sure people know that I own you like that. So I did it. I took a razor blade and I cut his name on my thigh. J-O-S-H-U-A-H. All seven letters across my my right thigh. Like big as well. Massive like that. That big kind letter. And then when that scar faded, when it faded, he was like, I want you to put it closer to your pussy. And I was like, what? He was like, yeah, I want it closer. So I sat down and I cried. I cried. I cried. I begged. I was like, please, that's going to be so painful. Like my thigh was already painful. I used to sell apart when I was younger as well. So I know how painful these places are. And he was like, I don't care. I don't care. Right. Okay. He was like, if you don't do it, I'm going to send you a note out. If you don't do it, you, everyone's going to see everything. So I was like, okay, fine. So again, seven massive letters across the inside of my left thigh. And then that faded. And then he was like, this time, I want you to all across your boobs and all across the top of your, of your vagina. Again, I begged. I was like, please, God, don't make me do it. He was like, nah, you know exactly what the deal is. So I did it again. And then um, he broke up with me. And I was like, oh, right, okay, so I've just got basically across my chest and on my vagina, and you've left me. And that was like, as crazy as it sounds, it was one of the hardest things ever. Because this man, at this point, had become everything to me. He was my lifeline, he was my breath. I started to realise what kind of what kind of a person he was. And I started dating this other guy. And I was my virginity to him. And he's seen the massive scar across my chest at the time. It was still healing. Like, and he was like, what the fuck is this? And I had to lie to him. And I was like, oh, I'm severely depressed. My little cousin died. And it was the only thing that I could think that would make things feel better. You know? And he was like, oh, whatever. I'm sorry. Da, da, da. And then as my realisation of what kind of relationship I was with, I was in with Josh, started like becoming clearer. He just came running back and I lapped it up. He was telling me how much he loved me, how much he missed me. He asked me what I was doing while he was gone and if I'd been dating anybody else and if I'd met anyone else. And this whole time he's told me about all the threesomes he's had, all the gangbangs he's had, how many girls he's with women together, how he fell for this other girl called Astrid. And he can't stop thinking about her, but I'm the love of his life. And so I blurted out to him and I was like, yo, listen, I fucked someone. I fucked someone. I lost my virginity to someone else. And it was great. Got in his car, drove. And he came to grab me, put me in his car. I thought it wasn't, I didn't think it was going to be what it was. I did not think it was going to be what it was. But he put me, I thought he was coming to see me because he missed me, but he put me in the car, drove me to some random place. I don't even know where the fuck we went. We parked up somewhere and he just started beating me. He started slapping me up, ripping my hair out. And that was the first time that a man's ever beat me up. And I was hopeless and I thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to die. I thought this man is going to bang my head somewhere so hard. I'm going to lose consciousness and then he's going to stab me and kill me. But he didn't. He stopped once, like, I started. I started fully screaming for my life. Um, He stopped and he was like, that's what you get. He was like, next time, don't fucking be a slag. And I was like, but you've gone, you've, you've done what you've done. How does me having sex with one person make me a slag and he was like, don't fucking question me, bam. And I was like, yeah, but that doesn't make sense. I said, don't question me, bam. And then um, the argument kind of fizzled out. And then he was like, what, you want to be having sex with one, my man? Because are you going to have sex with me right now? And I was like, I don't particularly want to be having sex right now. And he was like, you're going to have sex with me. I said, you're going to have sex with me, so you're going to. So even though, like, I said no, he did it. Anyway, he took it. That was the kind of person Josh was. And then he dropped me home. 
Like, I've never felt more dirty in my life. He dropped me home. I didn't speak to anyone for days. I didn't speak to him for days. So I got 100 missed calls from him. And he's talking about, where are you? Who are you with? Da, da, da. I've called him back. And... <laughs> <laughs> and I've called him back and he's not answered his phone. Now I'm ringing his line off, but now his phone's off. I wait through the evening, call him again, and he's gone back home to the Caribbean. I was like, right, okay, that's a bit abrupt. What the fuck? Like, what the hell? He's all talking about, oh yeah, I just came back home. I just couldn't deal with the with you. Like, I couldn't deal with that idea of you. Um, so while he's out there, he's being even more like controlling. He did not come back for months on end. Like when I tell you the controllingness, it went fucking wild. It went through the roof. It was to the point where I could not sleep, eat, shit, piss, drink without this man being on the phone to me. Like if I was to fall asleep, if I was if I was to fall asleep, right, he would have to watch me sleep on Skype. Like he would Make sure that I would be, keep in mind that I'm, I live with my mom at this point. My mom, my sisters, like, they'll go in and out of my room whenever they fucking please. So now my mom's coming onto it. My mom's getting onto the idea of why is there a man constantly watching you on the camera? Like, why is there somebody constantly on the phone to you? What's going on here? So now he's seen that my mom's a problem and my sister's a problem. My cousins are doing the same thing where I keep, like, I'm talking about the way the control went. It's like, I go to my aunt's house and this guy would have to be on the phone to me to make sure that I'm at my, my aunt's house and there's no men there and I'm not flirting with anyone else and uh, nobody's trying to fuck me and this, that, third. So, like, when my cousins and my mom started to question it and be like, who the fuck are you on the phone to constantly? Like, why have you got your camera on constantly? That's so weird. I would have nothing to say and be like, oh, it's just my boyfriend. Like, we, we're just like this, you know? And he saw that as an issue and his first response was, you need to not talk to them. They're trying to control your life. So, he kind of made me fall out with my mom. Well, he made me fall out with my mom. He made me fall out with my sister. He made me fall out with my cousins. So I had no support around me. I had no friends because he'd sent all my nudes to my friends. Um, my best mate at the time, when I first met him, had just like completely cut me off, but she was really creeped out by it. So basically he cut off my support system to the point where it was just that I had nobody but him if I had anything any issue I would have to ask him you know um, when that happened he obviously saw the opportunity of being able to blackmail me even more so after my 18th birthday I got my septum pierced I decided like I kept saying to him I want to get a tattoo like I'm 18 now I want to get a tattoo like Pete I was asking him for permission not my mum him please can I go get a tattoo please 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 he was like only if you get my name tattooed and I was like oh don't know about that one I don't know how I'm gonna cover that one up like from my mom because you know my mom my mom just walks into my room whenever you know but yeah sure I was like but please how am I gonna like he was like yeah you're gonna go get it done today and I was like okay I'll get it done today but you need to understand that I need to go and get something else alongside this tattoo to show to my mum because she's going to ask me why I'm wanting my ID and I'm going to have to tell her I'm going to get a tattoo and she's going to ask what's your where well, well, go and show me your tattoo then and I'm, what am I going to show her a name like on my rib and he was like right okay whatever you can get another tattoo as long as it's not anything big as long as it doesn't take away from the tattoo that you're getting for me I was like oh my god happy fucking days <sighs> gone to the tattoo shop I've picked out my tattoo, which was this one here. It's actually quite meaningful. I didn't know what it meant until like months after. Um, got the tattoo, got his name on my rib, and he was like super made up about it. He was like, oh my God, see, this is how I know you love me. Like, this is how I know you've, you've gone and branded you branded me yourself with my name, and now you belong to me, you're mine, you're my property now. Um, the blackmail never stopped. 
Um, in fact, it got worse. The money, like the price for not having my nudes sent out was getting more and more each week. And obviously I wasn't earning like £500 a week. I was only on like £200 a week. Um, so I could not like pay him. And he'd still send my notes out. Like this time it would be like, it wouldn't only be like one or two people, it would be like 10 people, 20 people. And then it got to like 30 people. And then it got to, I'm taking over your Snapchat posting my nudes all over my Snapchat. Like, obviously, with Snapchat, once someone logs you out, it tells you that you've been logged out and you can log back in, but by that time, like, he'd already posted, he'd already done the damage. Yeah, the Snapchat one, he'd logged in, he posted, I want to say about 15 nudes. I wasn't allowed to log into my Snapchat for an hour. an hour of people seeing these pictures of me. People I know, first and foremost. People I went to school with, my cousins. Like everyone. An hour of it, like, it, like I cannot explain the pain I was feeling like, because because he made me sit on my bed and I had my phone so the setup was like this had my phone here on my pillow he was watching me on Skype and I wasn't allowed to move any little move now he's going on my Instagram any tear like I wasn't allowed to cry um, but yeah I wasn't allowed to cry I was allowed to make a sound for an hour and then after an hour I was allowed to go on my Snapchat and I went on my Snapchat and it didn't even finish with him posting things on my story. He'd like gone through my chats with like some of my bestest mates and he'd sent him the most vile but the worst of the worst of those nudes, like the worst of the worst. And I wanted to die. Like, I'd easily say, like, I wanted to die from it being us being so good, like a few days, even a week prior to this, because I've got your name tied on my rib and we're all lovey dovey and everything's great. To now, you're going crazy on me for what? And then the next day, it was like, I want you to get another tattoo. I was like, isn't one enough? I was like, I can't do that. He was like, no, it's not enough. I was like, keep in mind at this point, like, he's already talking about coming back to the UK and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, thank God. He was like, I'll come back to the UK if you get a second tattoo. Jumped up, went straight to the tattoo shop. Tattoo man did not want to tattoo me, by the way. I had to argue with him to tattoo me. He, he was on the phone to me while I'm getting like into it with this tattoo, tattoo artist. He was all telling me, I'm gonna send your nudes out if you don't get this tattoo right now. If you do not convince this man to get give you this tattoo on your ass right now, I am going to send every single picture you have sent me to everybody you ever knew. So I'm like begging and pleading this tattoo with this tattoo guy. I've got him screaming in my ear like, calling me all sorts and the tattoo man I just started breaking down in front of the tattoo man I literally said please I'm begging you I need to get this tattoo right now and he finally gave in and the tattoo man was like I'm not tattooing your ass." I was like no but it has to be on my ass." and then the tattoo artist just he just finally gave in and I just took off my bottoms and he tattooed my ass with his name and I think he knew something was wrong and he did it. And the whole time, like, I just remember him apologising to me, like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And then I've got Josh in the other ear calling me fucking all sorts. And this tattoo man is just, like, apologising to me, like, I'm so sorry. No one ever apologised to me about it. 
back. Sorry. Um. Yeah, so we have the tattoo shop. Josh was over the fucking moon. Hi guys, so I'm just on my way to a tattoo artist, a very talented tattoo artist in Walthamstow. Um, I'm excited to interview her. You know, big up all the female tattoo artists because I know it's a male dominated industry, but I just, I'm on my way to meet her and just, you know, get some first hand experience from somebody who actually does this for a living and who meets people on a day to day who want to get these types of tattoos and just see like what her view is. And I feel like no one will be better than her telling us what it's really like on whether she thinks it's damaging, whether she thinks she thinks it's positive. So I'm super excited. Um, my name is Shana Kay. I've been doing tattooing for about a year now. Um, I'm 21. I'm based in East London, Walthamstow. Um, business name is TCS Tat, so get out my Instagram. Um, so a lot of tattoo artists could probably agree with me. I know a lot of tattoos have, tattoo artists have done it before, but as you can see, like, they'll do the initial or the name or the picture or whatever, but they'll do it very faint or they won't go over it as much due to the fact that in case you do break up, hopefully not, I'm not saying that you will, not saying that you, will, you won't, but at least you know, at least if you do break up, it will be faint, it will be easier to cover up, it will be easier to get it lasered off, it will be easy for it to fade away very quickly so it won't be as noticeable as if they were to do it over and over again type of thing. So I do feel like it is quite frowned upon in the tattoo community, many tattoo artists would refuse to do it if they know it's your partner and you're getting their name done especially if you have not been going out for a long time at all for the third one which was under my boob we just had an argument um at this point it the controlling and the manipulation was so bad that i wasn't even able to cut my hair i wasn't able to dye my hair I wasn't able to step out of my room without his permission. I wasn't allowed to change my clothes without his permission. Like, there were days as disgusting as a sound, yeah. There were days where he'd make me sit in my sweaty, stinky clothes for a week. He wouldn't let me wear different outfits to uni, like not uni, sorry, college. There were days where he wouldn't let me shower or brush my teeth. Like, I wasn't allowed to hang up. No, my phone was on 24-7. And if the phone did miraculously hang up or my phone died or his phone died or like the internet connection failed, I would have to face the consequences. I would have my news sent. It was his way or nothing. So when it came to the third tattoo, I was at my wit's end with the abuse, to be honest. And I didn't want to argue with him over it. I just said, fuck it, let's go. And then it came to the tattoo shop that he took me to. And it was the same tattoo shop where the man who did the one on my ass. And I literally said to him, I'm begging you, please don't make me go in there. I can't do this. I'm begging you, please don't let me go in there. Please don't let me go in there because they're going to deny me it. They're going to tell me no and you're going to get angry. So let's just go somewhere else, please. And he was like, no, I want you to go there. And I was like, no, Josh, then they're going to tell me no. They're going to say no. They're not going to let me get the tattoo. Like, they're going to say no. They're going to turn me away at the door. Like, please. And I was like, I'm, you're going to get angry at me and it's not going to be my fault. I'm begging you, please. Walked in. And no, before I walked in, you just gave me the dirtiest slap. Dirtiest slap. He was like, if I told you to go somewhere and I brought you all this way, you're going to fucking go. Slap me. Get out of the car. He doesn't come with me. He just sends me, like, the font that he wants his name in. And he sends me, he tells me that he wants it under my boob. So I go in. And it's the same tattoo artist. And he was like, what's going on? And I was like, I can't talk about it. And Josh is on the phone at this point. I've stepped out of the car to go into the tattoo 
shop, Josh is on the phone. Like, as soon as I've stepped out, he's rang me. And, um, he's gone, what's going on? I was like, I don't want to talk about it. I was just like, can you please tattoo me? And he was like, no. I was like, again, begging him, please tattoo me. Otherwise, this is going to get me killed. The man writes me a note and passes it to me and he said, do you want me to call the police? And I just said, no, don't. And he was like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah. He tattoos me. He doesn't even charge me the full amount. Like, he charged me that like 40 quid. It was an 80 pound tattoo. He charged me 40 quid for it. Um, and I left. I apologised to him. I said, I'm so sorry. Like, are you going to be seeing me again? And then get back in the car with Josh. He asked for me to back out my boob and show him the fucking tattoo under my boob. I do that. And there's something called, I don't know if you know about it, second skin. It's like this tattoo thing, like it's like, you know cling film? They, they put cling film on it. It's a type of cling film that sticks to your skin like, and it stops it from moving around. They had put that on it. And so fresh tattoo and he just ripped it off. And he just started prodding and poking and seeing how it's done and like pulling my boobs. So like, keep in mind, tattoos are wounds. They're cuts into your skin. So when you're stretching it, the pain is unreal. He's doing all of that to it. And then out of nowhere, he just starts getting really angry. And he was like, did a guy do it? I said, yeah. He was like, why the fuck are you getting a guy to tattoo you? I said, babe, there was no one else in the shop. I told you, let's not go to this shop. He was like, I said, why the fuck are you letting a guy look at your boob? Touch your boob. I was like, you gave me no choice. He was like, did I tell you to fucking answer back? I was like, I didn't answer him. He said, did I tell you to answer back? I didn't reply and then I just started getting beatings. Ripping my hair out. He's ragging me about the car like I'm a doll. Banging my head on the dashboard. Like, it made no sense. And then... I just dealt with it. I just dealt with it. I took it. I took the beating. and I was like, you know what, like, if I retaliate now, if I try and make a noise now, he's going to keep going. So I'm going to just, in my head, it was like, just don't say anything because it will stop. He'll get bored. If he gets no reaction out of you, he'll get bored. And that's exactly what happened. He drove me back home, jumped out the car. I waited for him to drive off and I went straight to my friend's house. I didn't want my mum obviously seeing me, like, crying. Fucked up. Do you know what I mean? Like, went straight to my friend's house. My friend asked me what happened. I just said I got jumped. Um, and then everything was alright again. It just seemed like every time I did get the tattoo, every time I did brand myself with his name, everything was good for a few weeks. That appeased him for a few weeks. And that was like me being this perfect girlfriend and me listening to him and me obeying everything he had to say, keep in mind in between these whole episodes that I'm having these fucking episodes of me getting beaten up and me getting verbally abused, he's constantly creating arguments. So he has a reason to blackmail me. And if the blackmail wasn't working, it was, again, like, I'm going to fuck you up. I'm going to kill you. He thought I was cheating on him, so he made me take my MacBook, flip it inside out until it cracked, like make the back of the the front and the back meet until it cracked. He wasn't convinced it was broken, so he made me put it on the floor like that and he made me jump on it. Again, didn't convince, wasn't convinced it was broken. Made me take the cup of water I had on my bedside table pour it all over my MacBook and then take it and dash it down the stairs. My mom came running upstairs with it. I was like, what the fuck have you done? I wasn't allowed to talk to my mom so I couldn't explain to her that what had just happened. I couldn't even make an excuse and be like, oh, I don't know. I just had a fucking manic episode. I just, I just don't know. I just got really angry at it and I just fucked it up. I couldn't even say that to her. Like I had to just 
look at her and walk away with me. Like, my poor mum, like, she knew that I was going through something, but she couldn't help me because I wasn't able to talk to her. Like, I couldn't talk to anybody about it because he took that away from me. I was really, really struggling and I was really, really drowning and all I wanted to do was for someone to know what was going on. And I couldn't, I couldn't tell anyone, anyone who received my news, I couldn't explain to them that it wasn't me. I couldn't apologise to them. I blame myself for him treating me the way he did. Everything was my fault. Everything was my doing. Anything bad that happened to me was my fault. And that was the hardest part. Because to this day, it still feels like it's my fault. It's not my fault. I know it's not, but he's made me believe it for so many years that it's so hard to get out of the mindset. He manipulated you. Yeah, he, no, I always say this. He erased who I was and made me something that he wanted me to be. And ever since then, I've been fighting, like, internally to get myself back to where I was. And it's so hard. Like, no one ever sees this part of being in an abusive relationship. Like, no one ever gets to experience this part of it if you're not in it. Because the manipulation runs deep. Has done to me. Like, I'm 24 now. This started when I was 16. Eight years. It's a long fucking time. A long time. And I still feel the effects of it till today. The fourth one was he flew back to the Caribbean. This was around like Christmas time. Again, convinced I'm cheating on him, convinced. And I was like, no, this time I offered. I said, do you want me to go get a tattoo of your initial on my ankle to show you how much I fucking love you again? I was like, oh my God, babe, like, I never expected you to offer something like that. It's always me who's asking. I was like, no, no, like, I'll prove myself to you again. If you want me to, I'll prove, prove myself to you again, and I'll do that, and I'll do it. And then I'll book my tickets, and I'll come out to see you. now where we're in the danger zone the third stage is proving yourself okay and i have to say that we've been the third stage is proving yourself at this point the receiver or the victim feels worthless they are unsure if their partner truly loves them because their partner is hot and cold because their partner is mean sometimes nice sometimes because a partner sometimes airs them because a, you, they, they've heard rumors that their partner is with this gyal and that gyal they prove the prove yourself stage you would do just about anything to prove to this man or woman that i'm yours i'm not cheating on you i'm gonna be with you through thick and thin i don't care if you have zero pounds in the bank i don't care if you are rich and successful i am here to prove to you that I'm your bio giant chick. I love you like no other. I don't care about your money. I don't care about your effing status. We're going to be like this forever. I want to prove to you I want no other man. No other man or woman will touch me. Your financial status is irrelevant to me. I will be through, be with you through every storm. If you go to jail, I will wait. If you cheat on me, I will forgive. Even if it kills me. The prove yourself stage is when you have lost it all. You have lost all self-respect for yourself. And if you are in this stage, Sis, you deserve better. I was in that stage. I was desperate, desperate for a man. I was desperate for a man to validate me. I wanted that man to prove. I wanted that man to believe. I 
I wanted that man to believe that I loved him. I wanted him to believe that I would do anything for him. If he was sick, I would give him my lung. I would give him my kidney. I would jump in front of the road and take a bullet for him. I wanted him to believe it, but he already knew I would. He already knew I would. And all these men and women already know. They already know that you would. They know it. They know it. It is BS. It is fake. But when you're deep in it, you feel like you have no other choice. This person is the love of your life. This person is the love of your life. And you feel like they've been hurt in the past. They're broken a little bit. They have some trauma. And all you have to do is show that you're different from other women. You're different from other women. And you would do anything for them. So you want to prove yourself. Never, ever prove yourself to anybody. If someone gets to know you and they cannot see your heart, then that's it. Never, ever, ever prove yourself to nobody. Someone gets, should get to know you with respect. Never feel that you are desperate and you have to prove yourself to anybody because the only person that you owe anything to is yourself. Sorry, passion. I've already touched on the fact that they are always aware of their manipulation. They are always aware of what they're doing. As women, we might make excuses that they're, they're hurt, they've got trauma, their dad was, was not in their lives. All this nonsense. What about you? What about the women? What about the victims? Why does someone else's pain matter more than your own? At the stage that you're proving yourself, there is, you've lost yourself. Maybe not intentionally, because like I say, you have been manipulated. So it might not be intentionally, but you have lost yourself. You have allowed a human being to get into your head. You have allowed a human being to make you think that this or them is what you need and this is love. Love is the most beautiful, beautiful thing we have on this planet. The most beautiful thing we have. And people abuse the word love. The last stage isn't straightforward because the last stage is either freedom or tragedy. And what I mean by that is sometimes the relationship was so toxic, there was tattoos, there was abuse, there was severe abuse, there was mental anguish. Sometimes the trauma that's happened in that relationship is so far gone that it ends in disaster or it's, it's, it's somewhat irreversible to that person. And they might seek counseling, they might seek A, B and C, they might go to church, but they live with this hole inside of them. They feel broken. They can cry at um, the, the drop of a hat when they talk about their trauma because it sits to them. There's a darkness inside. There's a darkness inside. That is the tragic ending. But there's also another ending. And if you're watching this, 
you will not have the tragic ending. Because you deserve better. Because the other ending is freedom. Make a promise to yourself that if there's a red flag in a relationship, you would do your research to find out that what you're in is an abusive relationship and not love. Some the reason I'm doing this documentary is when I was when I was in it and I thought that this person was the love of my life, I never went on Google or the internet or YouTube or TikTok to look, to see, are there things this person does that makes him a narcissist? Are there things this person does that makes him abusive? Does this person love me? I was somewhat isolated from my friends because my partner didn't like my friends because all they told me was that he didn't love me and they just said negative things. So I isolated myself. They are women out there, guys. I was, I went through my depression, depressive, um, my depressive state for four years. I feel so guilty sometimes because I just think I hate myself for putting myself through that. I hate myself for it. Why? I just hate that I, I hate that. I allowed myself to be so upset over a man for four years. Four years of my life, I should have been enjoying myself. I should have been loving myself. I should have been treating myself. Don't do the same thing I did. Don't make that mistake. Right now, I'm passionate about this, but trust me, right now I am, I am healed and I'm free. And that's why I'm doing this documentary because there's someone out there who's not free. Don't give your life. Don't give your life to a man, to a bad man. You can escape, you can escape. The person might not be, the person might be evil, the person might not be severely evil, the person might not be the worst of the worst. But if someone is taking your life and sucking out the light out of you, just sucking it out of you, sis, you deserve better, okay? I do not, want whether this whether it's a young woman with this woman in a marriage we just have better as women do not give your life to a man there is beauty in life outside of romantic relationships the only ones that deserve our attention are the non-toxic healthy lovely ones do not give your life away for a toxic person. It is extremely worrying when people give their lives away for a toxic person because sometimes they will stall on their dreams, they will stop doing things they want to do, they might have be isolated and not have friends because they give themselves to a man. It's like being in a prison. Freedom. Freedom is the last stage. And all my girls that are sat on this sofa are free. They're free. They were in abusive relationships and they are better. We will all continue to make mistakes as we go on in this life, in this journey. But guys, if you are watching this and you reckon... I had a friend who was um, a butch lesbian um, and I opened one of her snaps and she has like a very deep set voice and he's heard this deep set voice and he's thinking that it's a guy and the next thing I see my mom gets a message from Facebook and it's from me. And it's every single nude that I've taken and sent him in her inbox. 
Within 30 seconds, my whole family is calling my mum's phone. And my mum's called the police by now, at that hour. My cousins have called the police. My dad's on his way home from Milton Keynes. Everyone's coming to my house. Like, he's changed all my passwords to everything. And he's posted the nudes up and I'm getting messages on my phone and people are messaging me like, yo, what the fuck is going on? And I just, I wanted to die. Like I genuinely locked myself in the bathroom. I broke one of my razors and I just started cutting my wrists. I just wanted to die, I wanted to disappear. Like the ambulance had come to my house because my cousins had rang the ambulance saying that like they're scared that I'm doing something, they couldn't unlock the door. And the ambulance came in and like broke the door. Well, they didn't break the door. They op I opened the door, my cousin opened the door and they just like came in. Everyone was in my house and everyone was like so confused. And they were all like, and I get it, I understand it their reaction, they were all like really disgusted with me. They're really disappointed in me. One of my cousins, bless her heart, I love her to pieces. She called me a dirty pig. Um, repeatedly to my face. Damn. Yeah. My cousin, he wouldn't stop calling me a whore. So they didn't support you? No. Nobody had that back. They, your family didn't recognise that that was abuse? No, no they, they obviously knew. They knew. But it was like obviously coming from a Kurdish background. It's not something that you face. It's not something that you do. You don't send nudes. Men don't see your body. They tried to help. They tried to, but I guess, like, when you've not experienced it before, you don't know how to help. And at that moment in time, in 2017, the Revenge Porn Act had just come into play. Like, it just, like, literally, as my case came to the police, the Revenge Porn Act had just come out, like, a week or two beforehand. So they didn't know how to react to my case. And the first thing they could do was interrogate me. <laughs> it seems like the only person that really saw your pain and saw you as a victim is a tattoo artist. Yeah, it was literally the only person who genuinely saw me was the tattoo artist who tattooed his name on my ass and my boob. He was the only person who ever apologised to me. Ever. Like, I didn't even get an apology from him. And there's this stranger who's tattooed me twice and he's, like, profusely apologising to me. That obviously my family members, they came to me in the years that have passed and have apologised for my pain and stuff. And like, they tell me how strong I am constantly and how much I inspire them and all of this shit. But I, I didn't want to become an inspiration to them. I just wanted to not be abused. Like nobody wanted to touch me. Nobody wanted to talk to me like, so my only thing was like, I had him and he, he wanted to talk to me again and he was apologetic and stuff like that. And, and then I was like, right, okay, I am going to look at flights to the Caribbean and I'm gonna book a flight and I'm gonna come and meet your family. He was like, oh, no, you're not. I said, yeah, the fuck I am. I was like, I've had enough of it. I was like, I wanna talk to your mum. I wanna meet your mum. I wanna meet your sister. He nearly killed me there. Like he beat me to the point of where I genuinely thought I was got like I actually believed like I I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die for the third time. Like I'm gonna die. Like this is it. He had me. So the first time he beat me up, it was because I wouldn't have sex with him. I remember when 
I was there. Because I wouldn't have sex with him, he beat me up brutally. Second time he beat me up. It's because he was bored. He had nothing to do. There was nothing to do that day. Everyone was out of the house. We didn't have a car. We were just chilling. And he just got really angry at his game. And he just started punching me in the face. And then the third time was where his mum pulled me to his side. So the third time he beat me up is because he thought I was fucking his brother. And um, he pulled me into the room. He had me in a chokehold, um, pinned up against the wall, banging my head against the wall, choking me at the same time. I bit his arm to make him stop. And then he like threw me on the bed like I was a fucking doll. And he had the PlayStation controller and he grabbed it and he just started smashing my head into it. Like it was on the bed and he had my head and he was just like mashing my head into it. And then once he was done doing that, he picked me up by my hair and he just threw me on the floor and just started kicking up, like kicking me stepping on my legs like and then he was done uh, i don't remember i just passed out and then when i came to i was still on the floor i went into the bathroom i looked at my face my eyes were fucking swollen i started bruising on my like because i bruise really easily i'd started bruising like here around the perimeter of my face like I started getting bruises around my mouth and stuff. And I just started crying, like crying my eyes out. And then at this point I had like four days left on the trip. Keep in mind my parents while I was in Paris with my college. Um, and then, yeah. And then I walked out of the toilet and his mum was like, you're coming grocery shopping with me. And I was like, I can't. She's like, you're coming takes me into the car, asks me like over and over again, is Josh beating you? And I told her no. She wouldn't let me out of the car until I told her yes. And she saved my life. She saved my life because when we got back to the house, I wasn't allowed anywhere near him. He wasn't allowed anywhere near me. Um, that night, they made sure that I slept with his sisters. Um, and then they spent the next four days making sure I was protected. I flew back to London. <laughs> well, in the this is how I broke up with him, by the way. This is the funniest part. <laughs> um, so on Skype, if you've got an Android, you can set to answer automatically. So before I left, everything in me was just like, say it to answer automatically. So I get to, I think it was Charlotte Airport. And I ring him, like just to let him know, like I'm alive, haven't died. And the phone answers automatically. This is gonna be TMI. <laughs> Um, but all I'm hearing is and moans in the background. I'm thinking before I left, something in me said on Skype, you can set to answer automatically. Like something in me said that, do it on all his devices, really. So if one doesn't answer, the other, if one's dead, the other one answers. Um, so fuck it. <laughs> so I call him when I land in Charlotte for my layover and all I can literally hear is I can hear bones in the background I'm thinking what the fuck is going on keep in mind I'm surrounded by white businessmen so there's little Middle Eastern me in the airport just chilling vibes in and I'm just like what the fuck is that what the fuck is that and then the screen starts getting like 
lighter in the sense of the image becomes brighter on my on my phone. And I'm seeing boobs, and I'm seeing dick, and I'm seeing a vagina. Yeah. And I'm seeing sex happening. So in the middle of Charlotte Airport, yeah, I'm screaming. I'm like, who the fuck is that? Who is that? Josh, who is that? Who is that? The bitch picks up the phone. I don't blame her, to be honest. Bitch picks up the phone, goes like this. He's got, he's there. She's on, like, in doggy. Yeah. I don't even want to say it. Oh, do I beat him out like that? Yeah. He was fucking his cousin. Huh? He was fucking his cousin. And that's how I broke up with him. That was the final straw for me. I just said, we're done. But didn't sex? Yeah. I was screaming. I was like, we're done. Fuck you. I'm done with you. Da, da, da. He's laughing at me like it's some joke. He was laughing at me like it was some joke. So then I hung up the phone. I straight called his mum and I explained everything. Everything from day one up until that very moment. Well, I started off with just to let you know your son is fucking your niece. Right now, in this very moment, they're having sex and I've just witnessed it on Skype. Um, number two, your son has been abusing me for the past three years. Was she disgusted? Oh, she was, she was horrified. She was horrified. That woman, bless her soul, she was hor- horrified. And then... He had a good mom. He did. She saved me. She saved me and I'll never forget it. So when I got back to England, obviously his mom, I told her when, when I was in Charlotte Airport, because she was at work, I, I gave her just like a brief overview of what was going on. Um, but when I landed back in London, I made sure that she gave me a call, like when outside of the house. And I just literally said everything. I said, listen... He's put me through X, Y, and Z. He's made me do this, this, and this. And I just want you to know that he's made me suffer for a very long time. And I just don't know who else to tell because I've got nobody left. He's made me, yeah, I have no family around me to, to do something about it. So I'm telling you, as a mother of daughters as well girls as well you need to please do something about this man i understand he's your son i understand he's your firstborn child but please for anybody's safety in that house you need to do something about it and then she did she called the police so his dad was a part of the as far as i'm aware uh the police out in the Caribbean, so his mom called the police. They came, they raided the house, they took everything that belonged to him in the sense of laptop, iPad, phone, tablets, his PlayStation, anything to, like that you were able to message on and like stuff. They took it all, they seized it all. And minus the pictures that I'd sent him over the years, he'd been screenshotting pictures of me while I was getting changed in the shower, this, that, the third, and he had a folder of about, I'm not even joking, I think his sister said something between like 25,000 and 100,000 pictures of me naked. And for me, that was really fucking scary. It was like, yo, what the hell fucking creep and then yeah i found out that he'd been arrested and he'd been detained and his mom obviously when i told her about all the blackmail and stuff i woke up a couple days later from landing she sent me about three and a half grand to compensate for her son's doings and that obviously was not something that i wanted her to do but she did it with the kindness of our heart anyway but yeah, and that's how my breakup happened. And last time I heard from him, I want to say is about four years ago now. I'll say for you to be really cute. Yeah. I want you to close your eyes mm-hmm. and repeat after me. Mm-hmm. 
So say, dear, yeah, how old are you? 18? 16, whatever. I am. Okay, say, dear 16 year old Arj. Dear 16 year old Arj. I forgive you for being a victim. I forgive you for being a victim. I forgive you for falling for a narcissist's manipulation. I forgive you for falling for a narcissist manipulator. It was not my fault. It was not my fault. It was not your fault. It was not your fault. You are a beautiful soul. You are a beautiful soul. You are not a whore. You are not a whore. You are not a slut. You are not a slut. You will thrive in life. You will thrive in life. And that demon will rot in hell. And that demon will rot in hell. Okay, baby. Give me a Oh, thank you so much, love you. Um, so I remember her coming in the house and everything was just scattered, like the drinks, the, the pills, whatever. So she freaked out, called the ambulance. The ambulance came. I just remember being dragged into the ambulance and then waking up at the Royal Free Hospital and just feeling like what's going on like what's going on and then from that moment I had a, to be evaluated by different uh, doctors to assess my well-being my mental health etc they had to make me they had to pump my stomach of whatever pills I'd taken I had to drink this drink whatever to help calm my stomach because I just kept vomiting as well like 